right. Hello, everybody. Yay. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Yay. All right. Here we are at the June, uh, June edition of the Drupal NYC meetup. My name is Alex Ross. I will be your host this evening. Um, and uh, and let's, uh, let's get started. Here we go. All right. This clicker has like this like two second delay. So just bear with me if I click and then pause. All right. Um, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, please mute, mute your devices if anything's going to go jingle in the middle of presentations. Appreciate that. Um, if you're going to be asking questions, uh, hopefully, maybe we'll have a, a mic that we can float around. Maybe. I'm, I'm looking at people who may know. Yes. Yes, we will, in fact, have a mic. Um, and then uh, uh, restrooms, they have some of those here at, at, uh, at Mongo. There's a women's restroom right over there. There's a men's restroom right over there. Um, and, uh, and there's internet, too. They've got internet, which is fantastic. Bottom of every slide, you can find out how to connect to the internet. Um, and here we go. OK, uh, our agenda today, 6.30. We're doing some announcements. Um, we're doing those now. Uh, and, uh, and we'll have, uh, I think we have three presentations today. And we'll talk about what those are in just a minute. Uh, some quick cl closing remarks, and then after party is at the House of Brews. So for those of you who were members of Drupal NYC 10 years ago, you may remember that that is where we used to do our, our meetup after parties and, and all that kind of stuff. So we're back at the House of Brews. Fantastic. Okay. By the way, who, who was in Drupal NYC 10 years ago? One, two. Yeah, there we go. Uh, here we got a couple. Okay. What? Okay, not, you're not sure of your Drupal anniversary? All right. Um, today's talks. We have three talks today. Um, Sean is it's Sean. Where's Sean? I thought I saw Sean. That's you. No, you're not starting yet, but hold on. Stay there. Stay there. But you're definitely going to talk. Sean's going to be talking about using Lando uh, and Pantheon. Um, Lando, for those of you who haven't used it, is amazing. I'm a big fan overnight. Um, so, so he'll be going through that. Uh, Zoltan. I saw you. There he is. Uh, Going to be talking about the uh, upgrade status module for Drupal 9 readiness. Drupal 9 is coming, people. Um, so uh, we're going to learn a little bit more about that. And then John, who I haven't yet seen, but uh, but he'll, he'll be here. I have great faith. Uh, John's going to be talking. Uh, he wants to change the name of this to something else. Um, so we'll all tell him that we went in and changed the name of the slide, but I don't think anyone actually did it. So um, he's going to be talking about um, installing Node uh, for your project, but very differently and uh, in a very cool way. So he'll get into all that good stuff. All right. What else have we got? Our organizers. So we have uh, up here the pictures of our organizers for Drupal NYC. We love to put these up here, make sure everybody knows uh, who to give your feedback to, who to come with your great ideas. Um, many of the organizers are here today. I'm here. We got uh, Holing, uh, Gary, uh, JD, who's, there he is. Um, yeah. Chris is, is, is right there. There's Chris. So if you have ideas, if you have questions, you have feedback, um, we really do appreciate the feedback. We really do listen to you guys, and we, we try and uh, um, uh, take those ideas and, and pass them off as our own. OK. Um, uh, sponsors. Mongo has generously offered to sponsor our meetup, so we thank them. Yay! <laughs> Woo! You'll notice we're no longer in Rockefeller Center. This is, but if you look closely, you can see the Statue of Liberty from here, so it's just as good. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so we're going to be here for the for the foreseeable future. Now that we have food and drink sponsor Pantheon, thank you very much. Yay, Pantheon! Woo! Excellent. Um, uh, we definitely appreciate that. And uh, yeah. Uh, connect with us. We are on the Twitters. We are on the Slacks. We are on all the things. Please connect with us. Um, we have a um, uh, Drupal NYC Slack channel. Um, please definitely do join there. You can always, you know, get any of the organizers. Most of the people who are kind of regularly join this group are on there. Ask questions. You have a a, a New York centric Drupal question that you need to get answered. It's a great place to get that answered. But please do join us on Slack. Um, hashtags, photos, hashtags. If you take any pictures to make your coworkers jealous that they did not attend this fine event this evening, um, please make sure to hashtag Drupal NYC. 
um, uh, and uh, and share it with us on either the meetup page or on Twitter or Instagram, whatever you're using. As long as you use that hashtag Drupal NYC, we'll see it, and uh, and we can make sure that your coworkers are thoroughly jealous. Um, here we go. Uh, Drupal Association, please do support the Drupal Association. We are big fans of the Drupal Association. Yay! For those of you who are unaware or who are new to this meetup, the Drupal Association, very quickly, they are responsible for the health and welfare of the Drupal community as a whole. They own and run Drupal.org, for example. They make sure that um, the community uh, has all the resources it needs to thrive and to make uh, improvements to the Drupal project. Um, and uh, they do a lot of really important, whoops, I didn't do it. Um, <laughs> They do a lot of really uh, you know, important work for, uh, for the Drupal community to make sure that, uh, that it can run smoothly. So you can become a member of the Drupal Association. Um, it's a nonprofit. You can become a member as an individual, as a company, as a, you know. Um, so please go to, um, uh, uh, it's, it's drupal.org slash association, I believe will we'll get you there. Um, but a quick Google will get you to the right place. But please do become a member and help support Drupal Association. Uh, upcoming events, of which there are many. Um, Drupal Camp Chattanooga, any choo-choo jokes? No, nothing, okay. Uh, June 7th and 8th, that's this weekend, so um, get, your, get your plane tickets now. Um, uh, Drupal North in Montreal is a very cool event, it happens every year, June 12th through 14th, next weekend. Uh, Design for Drupal uh, in Boston is, is probably the biggest kind of front-end focused uh, Drupal event each year. Um, Decoupled Days, which used to be called Decoupled Dev Days, I don't know if that's true anymore, um, is going to be in New York this year on July 17th and 18th. Um, it's not only about Drupal, but it's often very much about Drupal. Um, and they are, uh, I shouldn't say often, it has always been very much about Drupal and how you kind of work in a decoupled world with, uh, with Drupal and all of the various, you know, kind of front ends that you might put in front of it. Uh, building Faster PHP Apps. Um, is coming in uh, mid-July, uh, the 22nd. Uh, Drupal GovCon in DC is a very cool, yeah, there we go. A fan, Sean is a fan. Um, that, what's that? Okay, I didn't follow that one, but. Oh, okay, there was a person's name, that's why I didn't know what we were saying. Um, but it's a very cool conference um, uh, and, uh, and I highly recommend it. Um, and then you can always go to uh, Drupal, DrupalCal or uh, groups.drupal.org slash events and find out about other events that we don't necessarily talk about. Um, but there's always somewhere to go. Um, there's always a camp. There's always a training. There's always a, uh, a con. Um, uh, and uh, really, you know, you, you can get a, a lot out of those, uh, those events. So I, I highly recommend them. Uh, interested in speaking. Um, we're always looking for people who want to speak at um, the, the NYC meetup. Uh, please contact one of the um, one of the organizers. We'll probably point you at JD since he's been kind of leading the charge right now with speakers. Um, but we we're we're looking for people who are willing to speak. A quick five minutes on that cool new module you just uh, found, you know, learned about is great. A, a really you know in depth hour long. We're gonna you know dive deep into this concept that we've been you know fighting with for a year. We now have a great solution for it. Is great. Expert level, terrific. For beginners, awesome, right? Whatever it is that you have that you're passionate about, that you're interested in, that you're been, you've been working on for a while, we would love to hear about it in one of these, um, uh, one of these events. Uh, also, if there's a particular topic that you're very interested in us trying to find some speakers for, let us know that too, right? We, we, we know people, we know people who know people. Um, so, uh, so we'd love to get feedback about speakers. All right, there we go. Let's try that again. Perhaps another time. Let's go back. There we go. Let's go forward. And let's go forward again and find that it doesn't work. So this building was built in 1967. It was completed in 1970. Oh, OK, here we go. Um, so that's my kid. That's Henry. He has lost seven teeth. He would like me to tell you that. Uh, he lost four teeth in a week, and we had to take out a second mortgage. Um, anyway. <laughs> Who's hiring? Raise your hand if you are hiring right now. Ooh, we got one. Okay, hold on. I'm gonna I'm gonna come up with that. JD's gonna come. Give us the give us the two or three sentences about who you are as a company and what you're what you're looking for. What are you hiring for? 
I'm Greg Kallenberg. I work for the New York Public Library and Heard of looking them. for a senior developer for uh, Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 migration that we're doing. Uh, it's a complete renovation project, so it should be an exciting opportunity. All right. New York Public Library, looking for senior devs. Anyone else? Anyone else hiring? All right. Um, hey, uh, Chris. This building was built in 1967. Okay, um, introductions. We love to do this. We want this to be a community where everybody knows each other. Um, please take five minutes, introduce yourself to someone who doesn't know you, find out about someone who you don't know, and then if all goes well, I will cut you off in the middle of the best part of whatever you guys are talking about, and, uh, and that will compel you to come to the House of Brews afterwards and continue your conversation with whoever that person is. Begin. <laughs> And stop, freeze, halt, cease, desist. <clears throat> All right, um, so hopefully my, my plan was successful and you got to meet some nice people and, uh, and you will want to continue said conversation. Uh, afterwards at House of Brews where we will all have a good time uh, Finishing the conversations. Okay, um, here we go. We're going to start off with our first presentation, which... All right, here we go. All right, so Sean Robertson, ladies and gentlemen, come on up. Sean is going to talk to us about Lando for Drupal with Pantheon. All right. Take... Do you have a plug for me to plug this into, to, to present? Uh, no, to present, I think you just need to... Chris, does he need to do anything or you switch it? Chris will switch it, so give me just a minute. And, or, or should we make Oh, it? I need to do it from the... Yeah, make presenting it. Uh, no, you can just do share. There we go. Thank Continue. you. You know, I should know this. I've done this on enough companies. Choose, yeah. There you go. All right. Got it. There he goes. You're and, up there. And... Um, it's happening, people. It's happening. Give me one second to get that out of the way because it's clearly in my way. Okay. Good. Just make sure you talk right into the mic. Yep. Give me one half second. I've just got to move this thing out of the way. So we didn't minimize this thing. Um, that's a good question. Yes. Hide video panel. And no, do another one. Maybe not. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll just do it. All right. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, how many of you all have dealt with? Really cruddy local development problems. Yeah, I assume that's most of the room. <laughs> so I've been around the block. I've been doing uh, Drupal for about 15 years. New web design development full time for about for about 15 years. But website design development full time for about uh, 21 years, and. One of the things that you find is when you're trying to get a bunch of developers work on the same project, well, it doesn't always go so smoothly. And I think we are all familiar with that mess. So what I wanted to talk about is a platform called Lando. Um, it's, let me uh, move here. So first of all, for you, ask who is this rando so i've been involved on drupal since 2015 uh, 7074 21 years we have design web development I, i've done over 220 websites and for democratic campaigns and related stuff okay. then everything from three websites for wwe and teach for america and a whole bunch of stuff that you probably all don't care about Hey, now, why doesn't he want to? There, okay. So, why when local dev strikes back? Now, we've all dealt with this crap, and I think you all know it. 
So you get, I don't know, three or four devs working on a project and somebody goes, well, that worked on my machine. Now, how many of y'all, raise your hands, how many of y'all have dealt with that mess? Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, I've been there, done that. Anyway, so what Lando does, Lando is a, a Docker Compose based and JavaScript based container. It's actually a wrapper around Docker Compose. And what it does is it sets up all of the hard crap. So you can literally run a command or two and you have your whole site stood up. It's the easiest darn thing you ever did. And what'll happen is you got a bunch of junior devs, right? We've all dealt with this. I mean, you got, I don't know, you got a couple of devs that have been involved with Drupal for maybe two years, and you got a couple that have been involved for three or four, and you got a couple like me that have been involved for five or six, but but you can get them all on the exact same platform. And so one command stands up the whole thing. And so, yeah, where'd my mouse go? There you go. So we can beat the empire. I know there's some Star Wars fans in here. So it's based on Docker Compose and it's written in JavaScript with a uh, JavaScript, uh, I don't know how you describe it, but it's a, it's a kind of spin off of JavaScript called Promise. Uh, some of you may have all heard of it. Um, it has very clean YAML based configuration. Um, one of the coolest things is that it has um, what are called recipes. And the idea of a recipe, and I, how many of you are familiar with uh, Pantheon? Right? You may have noticed that I'm wearing one of their t-shirts. I've known the founders for many years, but anyway, God love them. But um, so the idea is, with a single command, you can spin up a Pantheon recipe that is a direct mirror of one of their server infrastructure with everything. So all of the server infrastructure, whether you're talking about, um, um, uh, What's somebody uh, Apache Solar, or you're talking about the edge uh, infrastructure that they have, or any of any of that kind of stuff? That, you know, the the caching layer that they do, Redis, like one command will get you the entire thing set up. It's God's answer to the whole problem of well, it didn't work on. I mean, it worked on my machine, and. Um, I mean, I'll be honest, I, I can't tell you that, oops, the number of times that I have solved a random problem that all I had to do, the whole thing is exact mirror of the server. And I could look at it on my local machine and I could test it on my local and up on the cloud. That is worth its weight in gold. Now, what I'm showing you now, and you'll see here, uh, the first line in this um, uh, command line here, because I don't know if, um, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the guy, but anyway, there's a guy who did a presentation at the UN a while back, but, but the, this uh, command line thing is fish and um, a couple of things, anyway. If you want to know about how I got this command line to look like that, let me know. But um, anyhow, so the Lando init dash s source GitHub dash s recipe Pantheon, and then you'll see it prompts me for my Pantheon machine token, and then it asks me which repo is Sean R slash Webolutionary. Then it asks me for my email address, and then which site and the Webolutionary one, which actually is a domain I bought for myself back in 
2000 or 1997, believe it or not. But then it pulled the whole thing down. And uh, so that's got all of my, uh, you know, public private keys, all that mess. Oops, sorry, but not. So this is where it finishes the build out of that. And now you may see that green line. Now we're cooking the fire. So that means that I have a fully stood up local copy of my website on my local machine. Um, I can do a Lando pull, uh, I can do a Lando push. Um, you know, if I shut down Docker for whatever reason, I can, uh, when I restart my laptop, I can do Lando start and it'll, it'll go through everything. One of the things that's very useful is a Lando rebuild, which is, so if you, let me show you this. I, there we go. Um, how do I share my whole screen? Anybody know how to do that? So I want to share the entire screen. You are sharing your whole screen. And no, it doesn't appear to me. It's stuck. Go back to Zoom. And go to share. And do desktop one. Right. And that should share your entire screen. There we go. All right. Sorry about that. Can't, you can't do it. There you go, audio. Yeah. All right. So I apologize for that. Yeah, I've done too many of these in a little while. But um, one of the cool things about Lando, and I'm going to show you something that's a bit dated, I'm going to be honest. And um, so Lando is currently in beta right now. Um, it was in uh, a release candidate. No, actually, no, it was in alpha earlier, and I think now it's in release, can't, something like anywhere, neither here nor there. But um, the important thing is that if this thing would recover, okay, so what I want to show you here. So this is an old version of a YAML, a Lando YAML file, but it'll give you some idea of what you can do. So if you're familiar with Docker Compose, basically anything you can do in Docker Compose, you can do in a Lando file. And so in this particular case, I have here a node service set up on a Pantheon recipe. And the reason we did this is because we had a pattern lab set up um, where we were doing this whole crazy mess with the um, pattern lab and, and you know, we needed to actually do the style guide on an external server and it was yada yada, it was a mess, but anyway. But you can actually set up all of the libraries that you need and do the entire install, et cetera. And then if you look down here, so this is another example. So I can run Lando run and it will run that, uh, that command. So, and it'll run it within that document root and everything else. So there's a lot of stuff that you can do with it. It really streamlines local development and you can have eight or 10 developers on this and it takes some minutes to stand it up and by the time they're done well you don't have to worry about old rigmarole it just works so thank you very much appreciate it
Anybody have any questions for Sean real quick? Oh, we got one right We've there. We've got a question here. Hold on, come on back up. Thank you. Uh, just a very quick one. Uh, what would you say that this the the biggest difference between, for example, automation like uh, Chef Puppets or Ansible with this? It's, it looks like very similar, like a very, very cool product, but it looks similar a little bit to Ansible. Is there a, like? Well, I would say that probably the biggest advantage is that it is a very, very clean uh, YAML configuration in which you don't really have to know a whole lot about it. And it, you commit it into your repository and GitHub or Bitbucket or wherever you wish. And uh, the, the general sense is that that's just in the repo. repo. And all any dev, you know, you hire a new guy, right? So the new guy comes in, a new woman comes in. And all you have to do is say, install Lando and then do Lando start. And it's running. And you have, and by the way, this is, this is crucial. And I, that, I forgot to mention this earlier, but one of the biggest wins. How many times have you all dealt with port conflicts? I, I'm sure you have. So Lando actually takes advantage of um, Docker's built-in um, uh, proxy system. So you could actually be running a a website on Pure Docker, and this is how I found it, as a matter of fact. And I got really lucky several years ago. But you could be running a, a Pure Docker setup and then spin up Lando next to it. Lando will automatically find a port and then it will map the domain whatever.lndo.site to port 80. And so you don't even have to think about ports. It just does it for you. Do you know how many times that saved my butt? <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, looks like that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. All right, Sean, thank you very much. There you go. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you, Sean. Um, hold on. Let me get this back on here. <laughs> there we go. All right, Zoltan, you're up. Here to talk about the upgrade status module for Drupal 9 readiness. Are you ready? <laughs> See what I did there? Come on. All right. Go ahead. Sultan. All right. So can you see my screen? Good. Hello. <laughs> can you hear me? Nice. OK. So hello. My name is uh, Zoltan Herzog. I am a Drupal developer at uh, Chappers. Uh, since uh, two years, I guess there are some core issues that are older than my experience with Drupal. Yeah, so first of all, let's, uh, let me introduce my company uh, in a few uh, seconds. So we are a Hungarian company, but we have, uh, so we, there are Chappers USA here in Manhattan. You can reach us here. Uh, what we do consulting. Uh, UX and UI design, uh, Drupal development, and also cloud engineering. Uh, Drupal is not just a technology for us. So in this year, January, when uh, there was the Drupal Global Training Day, we organized a workshop, uh, both for uh, beginner users and both for advanced users. The beginner users walked through the Drupal admin user interface, while the advanced users uh, try to try to cre create a custom uh, module for it, so also for if you are uh, some way uh, think of moving to Hungary, <laughs> we we also uh, hiring. So yeah, enough of this. Before we move on, I think I'll have a question. So how many of you? Um, 
participated in a project where you had to upgrade from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. Okay, I see a few hands. So maybe the guy who are hiring for this is, <laughs> you have to remember the faces. All right, so, and how many of you know anything about Drupal 9? Okay, I see one, two, three hands, four. Good, that's good. So the main difference between Drupal 9 and Drupal, so the main difference between, between the last version of Drupal 8 and the first version of uh, Drupal 9 will be, so get rid all the deprecated code and there will be some third party uh, updates as well. That's it. So if you want to check that your module, your country module or your site contains uh, deprecated code, you have tools for that. And today I'm gonna uh, demo one of the tools that you, that is available. So it is upgrade status contrib module. Uh, it has a Drupal 7 uh, version, but what I'm, I will talk about is the Drupal 8 version. So this module scans the code of the contributed and custom projects you have installed and reports on any deprecated code that uh, must be replaced before the next major version. So yeah, it tracks it. And uh, available project updates are also provided uh, to suggest you the latest version. So maybe the maintainer will resolved some deprecation errors over time. Uh, this module has to be installed via Composer because we are depending on third-party uh, PHP libraries as well. One of them is PHP Stan, which is a static code analyzer uh, application in the CLI, and uh, which allows you to to create your custom rules uh, to check for for specific um, to specific scenarios in your own uh, code base, uh, and the other one is Matt Glayman created the rule to actually detect uh, deprecated code in your in your Drupal code base. Yes, yeah, so after a fresh install, you'll get a menu link item under your uh, reports menu. And if you click on it, and yeah, after it loads, <laughs> you will get this screen, uh, which is right after a fresh uh, full scan. So here you can see all your custom modules and themes. This is uh, this gets a higher priority because you have uh, much more impact on your custom code, and here you can see the contributed modules and themes. These are projects. Uh, these are projects. So every row is a project, not just a module. Uh, by project, I mean that. So here we can see. Uh, the custom project of a classic Drupal 8 website. Here you can see my uh, custom module, which contains also other uh, modules as well. I can enable this one and this one separately, but here you will see the root module. Uh, a, real, a good real world uh, example will be commerce. So if you use commerce and uh, you can enable, uh, for example, the cart and order and payment separately, but the root project will be commerce in this case. So these are root uh, projects. After you hit the scan button, it will open a progress bar soon. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I should use Lando. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it will, it will um, open a progress bar, which will, uh, as results 
comes in, it will update the related row of the table. Here I can see that this module is contains uh, one error and uh, as uh, time passed by, table will fill itself. And yeah, so how, uh, so the way we implemented this is we are, if you are a Drupal developer, you might think that, so how many of you think that this is a batch process? Okay, okay, thank you. And so this is not a batch process. <laughs> so we use Drupal's built-in queue API, which is like a to-do list with items. Mm -hmm. Items are the projects, as I mentioned. Uh, in every iteration, uh, a JavaScript magic will uh, takes one item from the queue, analyze your project, and store the result in the database. So if you want to see that what is the exact error in this module, I'll click on the view. And it's uh, not just said, not uh, only says me that what I use is uh, deprecated, but in which file and on which line. So if I want to search for it, I just open it in my editor. And it said that uh, I should find something on line uh, 11 which is uh, true. I don't know if you can see it, but this is menu cache clear all function, which is deprecated. Also, you get um, extras because if you click on it, uh, it will open uh, a Drupal API uh, documentation page where you can see that this, this function is indeed deprecated and it will be removed before Drupal 9. So please use this service instead. So it, gi it gives you also an alternative on, on what you used before. All right. And uh, you can also export the report individually and after uh, and the whole process as well you will get this finely designed <laughs> result, which is just uh, enough. So yeah, after this, you can send this to your favorite developer, which will take care of it. <laughs> all right, so, all right, just a second. Here it is. So you can see that as time goes by, it will uh, analyze your whole code base. Uh, it takes time because, um, yeah, so PHP stan uh, is a memory uh, based application. And yeah, my computer isn't just not the best for this case. But um, yeah, so you can also, uh, so here I see that admin toolbar has one error, but uh, for contrib modules, we see that there is a new, a new version for that module. So if I click on it, it will navigate me to, to a page where I can see instructions about how to uh, update this module. So maybe the deprecated uh, deprecation errors are disappeared. Uh, if you, you are not a developer, but a site owner or a decision maker, this could be also good for you because if you see that every line is green, then your Drupal site is, is ready to, to update to Drupal 9. So yeah, and after, so here you can export the full report, which is uh, similar by approach that, than the uh, single one. You can also use this to, to 
create issues on contrib modules. But if you decide to do this, I think it's uh, it's a good practice to uh, hit up the issue queue before. And if somebody already reported the deprecated messages, then yeah, you shouldn't pause it. So yeah, that's that's uh, about the module. And one thing is so if you have your own CI CD pipeline, you can use a CLI tool to integrate it uh, into your uh, CI CD pipeline. For example, here I can see that admin toolbar has one error, which is yeah, the deprecated uh, function call to menu cache clear all. And if I run the uh, analyzer on this module, it will give me the same result. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> All right, what are we looking for? So this module is still in uh, alpha version. If you if you are you have some free free time and you want to give back something to the community, we are uh, looking for maintainers, also testers, not just backend developers but also frontend developers. So, if you are interested. Uh, you can ask uh, Gabor Hoechi. He is a really good mentor. He, is, uh, he was a core developer and also uh, part of the security team and so on. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. We have any question? Hold on, here we go. So I have a, I have a question. And then we'll see if anyone else has a question. Um, are there plans to have this run through the entire contrib library and automatically open up issues prior to the D9 launch? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, they are planning to use um, Matt Glayman's uh, Drupal check uh, CLI tool. So it will be built in into Drupal.org. If that was the question, yeah, yeah, yes. okay, yes, so yes, then then it's correct. So you can use this one. It's the same that I used here in the command line. All right, cool. Does anyone else have a question? Wait, wait, wait. Can you schedule a task to run it automatically so that I don't have to trigger every time? So, uh, if I heard that correct, so can you schedule uh, to run this? Hmm. You can put that on a cron if you are. Well, uh, if you if you ask for the module, then it it may have been a good feature request, <laughs> but uh, for the CLI tool, maybe you can use it uh, in cron. Yes. Okay, I have a question. So do I get it right? If I wanted to have a lot of uh, core commit mentions, I could just run this on, on, on contrib modules. It basically tells me what to uh, uh, replace with what and just create patches and, and have a lot of like contribution to Drupal, right? Yes. <laughs> but uh, that's why I mentioned that uh, if you plan this, be sure to check the issue queue. So maybe somebody already did what you want. So I think it actually makes, like it's easier to just fix it than create an issue. Uh, so it's so quick to, uh, it gives me all the, the information I need to actually fix the issue. So I think it's it's just faster to to do it and then post the results than create the issue and create it back. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I apologize for the interruption. Um, I wanted to uh, follow up on questions asked over here. Um, so, remind me, what was the last question before his? I apologize. Yes, no, okay. So, now I think the best way to do that, 
Um, now, so this is one thing that I, I didn't show you all during my Orlando presentation, but you can do this. So you can set up um, Circle CI with GitHub and push it all to Pantheon. Of course, I'm wearing a Pantheon t-shirt today, but God love them. I, they're friends of mine. But um, so what you can do is you can set that up so that every Git push causes a, a build. And Maybe this is a really good idea. And then Circle CI will run through all that. Um, there are a few other ways to do it too. You can do it with uh, Bitbucket and, and uh, Jenkins pipelines, which is frankly kind of a pain in the neck, but I've done it. But you know, there's no more ways around that cat. So anyway. Thank you. Any other last questions, comments, concerns, jokes, poems? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, oh, one, one, one quick note. Be careful if you do make that a step in your build using Circle CI or whatever CI tool you want to use. Be careful about contrib modules because you may not have. They may not be fixed yet. And you don't want your build to break because someone else's code hasn't yet been fixed, right? So, right, you can ignore those that that directory or whatnot. And all right, so next we have John Pugh. John, are you ready? All right, so come on up, John Pugh. Uh, is going to talk about uh, uh, Node.js in Composer installing. There's a lot of things. There were words. There were a lot of words. And I'm. I'm yeah, I, it, yes, it's been, uh, yeah, okay. So this building was built in 1967. Uh, all right, here we go. Thank you, Boone. John Pugh, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. Thanks all for coming to the meetup. New location, new energy, I love it. Okay, this is a fun, Fun little talk. This is like tribal composer JavaScript knowledge that not many people know about. Let me stabilize that. Excuse me, pardon the puns, but this talk's called Node and Composer Sitting in a Git Tree, I N S T A L L I N G. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. That's my talk. Good night. Okay. There's JavaScript and there's PHP, right? And they will forever battle and there'll be different meetups and they'll fight in bars and there'll be the apocalypse and they'll be battling over it. But basically they all coexist and serve different purposes and work together all the time. So they're more like siblings, right? That have their own little worlds going on. <laughs> so roughly, Node.js is basically JavaScript, right? But with some extra stuff to get it to run on servers and some other things. Symfony is kind of a tool that makes PHP easier to use too but they both have this thing that's like a package library. So JavaScript has NPM and comp PHP is Composer. And so a ton of the front end world knows all about NPM, right? And they know all about Bower packages and all these things and they can just do NPM install bootstrap and they come to Drupal and like, what, you don't NPM and you don't node and, and everyone starts fighting again. <laughs> so, but the point is they're fundamentally the same. They, they track the versions of all the different things, tools that you can do out there. Think of them like Drupal modules even. And they let you just very easily down, like add them to your project and all Composer allows you all these commands to do this stuff. So this Composer wins, we're on Drupal. So this is about putting Node in your Composer. We're not gonna bother with the other way around. <laughs> we, can, we can fight about that another day. All right, so for example, when you do npm install, it puts a JSON file on the left. When you do Composer install or require or whatever, it makes a JSON file on the right. They're very similar, right? I don't need to get into the details, but Drupal kind of unifies all this stuff. Um, there's a lot of Drupal stuff, a lot of Drupal projects use Node for their themes and all sorts of other things. Some people use NPM tools like Grunt and Gulp for their DevOps systems and there's like a million tools that are used in a million different ways. Um, and it's, they don't always get along when you actually go out there and deploy it uh, because they are actually two different systems. Um, they have different commands, they expect different environments, like it's not completely analogous and so when you get into the world of like having to build these multiple projects, you end up with a lot of weird things happening, two teams fighting, you know, on and on and on. We could talk about it forever. But this is a kind of a lightning talk because it turns out 
all these tools came about, but we can kind of, in our world, we're lucky on Drupal Composer is that it's awesome, is that you can now bring everything, all of these tools power this decoupled Drupal movement, and we can now include these libraries directly in Drupal to unify our build process. Okay, so when you have the, oh, you got to NPM install it. So here's an example. How many people have seen a company wiki similar to this? <laughs> How to get the Drupal running. Okay, I think you do this, and then you install, and then you run, go in the theme that we copied three times, and then you run this other NPM thing, and then hopefully you have the right version, and eventually somebody writes, wait, that didn't work, and then somebody's smart enough to at least put a to-do in there saying, hey, it doesn't work, this is the person to go ask to get it to work. To work. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've experienced that in some way. All right, not everybody, but this is good. Hopefully you, don't, you new people won't have to deal with this anymore. Okay, because there is a better way. Hello, they're both JSON, JSON object notation, it's curly brackets and stuff, it's a machine readable thing. Uh, you can actually include these in your PHP Drupal Composer JSON. The professional packages do it. Acquia Lightning does it. It's like the most professionally maintained Drupal distribution out there. You simply add this repositories tag to your Composer JSON, and then you can Composer require node assets and Bower assets. And what that means is, if you don't know, npm. Uh, you know, what is it, js.org stores all these repos and you can just name it and the tool will figure out the version. You don't even have to pick the version, right? The tool figures out all the versionings and can package your thing up together. And then in, Drup in the Drupal world, you do run this composer install and it's scaffold, that, that's like the standard way to get Drupal 8 running. But now, yeah, sure. So this is, I'm gonna post the link to these slides on the meetup as well, um, but Basically, you, you're gonna learn, if you're learning Drupal, you're learning Drupal 8, you're gonna hear of Composer, and you're gonna learn, you have to run Composer install to like put in all the different pieces, right, that need to get Drupal to work. Now you can also do that with like the front end libraries that all the modern front end developers like to use. All right, and so that way you don't have to have this like separate build process to include these special libraries like Bootstrap, jQuery, and there's a million others. Um, so this makes the life a lot easier, right? And there's a, there's a second tool you need to know about. The assetpackages.org is that first one. Um, you can, if you can't get away from this, like if you have a theme or a subfolder or some pattern lab thing that they've developed and you're jumping in at a crazy project and you're not sure how to build it, you can still bring some sanity. Like if you, you might not be able to achieve this, like just using that require statement, like the people there might say, no, no, no. That's not going to scaffold it correctly. You still got to go into the folder and run Bower install or something like that, right? You can actually install Node itself into your directory, just like you would install Drush or these other binary commands. And I'll put the mic down and demo this in a second. But yeah, and you also don't have to worry about the version because when you run Composer install, it actually pulls in the npm command. So you don't have to put it on the server at all. And it will actually look and see if it's already there and use it or ignore it. And you can do high, good config to say like, this is a huge problem when you become an experienced kind of developer in big projects. What node version did you use to run, <laughs> run the build process? That's like a dependency that you don't want to have to deal with. So you, there's now this library by this MOF, I don't know, M-O-U-F, <laughs> Node.js installer. Try to remember that. All you got to do is this composer require Node.js installer. <laughs> okay. Point the bin directory. This is a composer thing. If you don't do this, you have to call vendor bin Node.js. Just call this command. It'll set your composer JSON to config. <laughs> wow. Okay. There we go. And then composer install does it all. And then you can literally just run bin node v and you don't have to be like, how, did I, how do I install node on my Mac using these three or four different tools? Or how do I install XYZ on, in Docker and what version is it running? It's actually part of your composer install process. You can pin the version all, like you can make this so exact that you, you remove all these crazy things that happen when people are just like willy nilly putting commands on everything. Okay, so really important to learn that stuff, it's cool. Um, this means you can do crazy stuff, and I haven't tried this out yet, but pretty sure this would work. You just do composer and require Gatsby JS and downloads all of Gatsby and it puts it in a folder. And in composer, you can do funny tricks to say, put it in this folder. So this is about all the slides I got to make before this talk, but the point is like you can, in theory, have your headless Drupal and your Drupal core 
in web or Dockroot in the same repo, right? And have the same build process build both of them. Okay, put your React and your other stuff here and have the Drupal here, and you can have the same version when you release it, and they both get released at once, and you can develop them in tandem. And so I was thinking, let's try that, let's try. <laughs> uh, any questions so far? Nothing. Fantastic. How many people have done like Composer install on that command line yet? Uh, question. I'll repeat it. Go ahead. Pattern Lab. And so you mentioned Pattern Lab earlier, and I'm just curious uh, how deep you got into that, or if you've found well, I mean, to work with any other uh, systems, design systems. Uh, I'll walk you through this thing next. That this was going to be the next part. Scripts, Composer scripts let you write these arbitrary commands. So it's like you can create a command called build the theme and run exactly what you would run on the command line. Right, so if you're already familiar, like this is how I build my pattern lab, you CD in there and you do npm install, I'll show you right here, so. Um, I, yeah. Yeah, fish is really fun. Google Jesus Molivas fish setup, and he, this is not just fish, it's like a special font and a color, and he has a blog post, and I'll, I'll tweet it if people want it. It's the best, and you'll see why in a second. This isn't even the good, the best one. I go in here, it tells me like what branch I'm on and it's yellow because there's a git clean, unclean git status. Okay. Hold on, I need more stuff here. So I'm gonna put the terminal over here because I've already done some of this. There's a repo I made. Um, Uh-oh, can you bring my backpack? <laughs> I'm gonna plug in my laptop right behind you, buddy. Power's right behind you, JD. JD. This guy? Yeah. Quick, the black one on the table. Black with tape? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I heard backpack. <laughs> wow, it's really holding on right now, hold on. Wet. Zoom, by the way, make sure you're plugged in, it goes fast. Quality, but. Charging. Okay. Node Poser is the name of this repo I made. Um, I'm not going to deal with the asset packages stuff right now because it's kind of self explanatory. It populates all those JavaScript libraries because the powerful stuff is in, in Node. And I'm just going to demonstrate how the kind of scripts work and then because you can kind of take it from there. But when I do composer install, like Wi-Fi is good here, right? I can remove my vendor and install it. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> Once it's in there, the Node.js installer has a hook which downloads Node itself from the distribution as a zip file and puts it in your directory so you can just run it directly. And then when you run scripts, which you can easily make in your composer file, it's like a bare bones repo, right? Scripts, you can name them. Okay, and then whatever is under here is just run. But it, what's nice is when you set Binder, the path is already there. So you can say like, what version of node is it? And if you ever confuse and get stuck in like this world, you can call this command called which will help you out because it'll tell you which binary it's actually pointing to. And then you can also do an NPM version. Yeah, I thought that'd be risky to download it again. <laughs> so with these, there it goes, see? So it's downloading the tarball and actually extracts it. And then in your bin directory, there it is, node in npm. And you can call directly, you can call them directly. Uh, sorry, bin node, there it is. And then you can do npm install. Sorry. So, 
may not be clear, but you'll watch this later and talk to your friends and solve so many problems. <laughs> like figuring out what version of Node, figuring out all this stuff. And so the real fun part though becomes within like, what command am I supposed to run? It's such a pain really, okay? Asking somebody is one thing. Asking somebody and they tell you it's in a documentation, that's like a whole nother step. Like finding that URL, do I have access to that Confluence wiki or whatever? If you just put it in this scripts, you can just call composer and it'll tell you when you write the J JSON wrong, but these turn into commands. What's my validator not doing? Oh uh, yeah, this is not a list, right? Composer. Okay, so Composer has built-in commands. It has these plug-in things you can install, but then it also takes the what's in your thing, and actually I'm gonna see it's kind of hard to find, npm install. What's really fun is if you give it a namespace in there, by which I mean NYC, like that, and it'll show up in like a group. So say I'm working on the NYC project, and like you want to have a theme rebuild command, you can simply do exactly, like go in here and set a theme rebuild command. I've done this before, like theme rebuild and it have an RMRF this folder and run this weird command. And so I've been able to like reverse engineer crazy build processes using composer scripts, right? By go like, go ahead and nobody knows why you have to run these four commands, but you do. <laughs> like, so before we try to re-architect everything, we just get it working. And this is a great way to kind of like bring some sanity to that build process. And now I can show you how it works. Composer is really easy to use as automatic kind of command shortening. You can just call the shortest possible unique combo. So N N actually, which should work. And there it is. So NPM install, NPM, you know, it gives you this unlimited kind of flexibility on these bigger projects where you need it. So yeah, that's, a, that's it, I guess, for the fundamental part of my, uh, that part of the Drupal talk. Do you have any questions? Questions, questions? Oh, on the far side. Um, so I'm not super familiar with front-end development. Like, are you using this almost strictly for the build process so that everything's in one get ready to go in one place? Or do you actually run both something that runs PHP and something that runs Node, uh, you know, in one location? Talking about building it versus hosting it? Yeah. Yeah, so this is really, what, this was all about building it. Um, like the thing that host node is a slightly different like setup. Like you would, you would, you could use node. There's a built in server for node development too. So you can call like node, I forget what the command is, right? Dash S or whatever to run a little built in server. But this talk was mainly about the build process and not really about. So you use node in your Drupal projects uh, build process and then it just uh, a lot of people do yeah generates the files and puts them in the public or somewhere yeah it'll download like the different versions of jQuery or special library like the front like for the select list this one magic library that does a good WYSIWYG it'll like pull in all those different pieces uh -huh. as a front end asset using this npm's repository basically they call it like it's like packages but for node and it's automatically downloads them and puts them in the same place every time so you don't have to add them to your personal repo individually got it and it's a little bit better um, because you kind of know exactly what version you're getting in your code base if you're downloading and adding that stuff somebody might change it and it's out of date it's harder to update so even though it needs to execute javascript to build uh it's then just getting served out as static files from drupal's perspective it, there's a number of options there it's like kind of an open-ended question but basically okay. yeah like you could put it in a slash app folder right okay. and tell your web server to allow that folder and just serve up like the, J, the JS and in, index HTML, right? All right. So there's a lot of, like, it's kind of open-ended question, so I can't answer specifically, but just trying to depending on the hosting environment, build it. Yeah. This, is all, this would allow you to do some funny, fun tricks like that, right? Cool. Where it could be hosted in the same Apache as Drupal, or you could kind of host it on a node, with a node container pointed at the different folder or something like that. Okay. Thank you. I'm gonna start experimenting with it pretty soon. Thank you. I actually have an answer to his question. Um, so I just worked on a massive, massive website for teachforamerica.org. And um, uh, the front end team used uh, Pattern Lab. And so we had, um, and this gets back to my Lando setup that I was talking about, and I wish I'd shown this and I didn't think of it. But, but um, so basically what we did was, um, we had 
uh, we use the Paralab, I mean, I'm sorry, the Lando Pantheon recipe. And then we added an extra node server to that. And so we were able to run the Pattern Lab, Pattern Lab style guide from that extra node service. Yep. And then, you know, basically the, the, the point was we could run all of this stuff pretty much side by side. And then when we actually compiled it, then we had, uh, we used, you know, we're in a Terminus t-shirt from Pantheon, but we used their Terminus uh, build tools platform. So in, in combination with um, uh, Jenkins, and so basically when I submitted a build request to the CI branch, it would automatically compile everything. And you'd end up with you know you'd end up basically with a multi dev branch on Pantheon with the whole kit and caboodle all yeah. set up. Yeah. And that's, that's what we point. try to do. Lando uh, node container, it's just like just like node, it's actually pretty basic to run a node server. You can look at that container, look at on on Docker Hub. Um, it's pretty, pretty straightforward, but, but it's, but, but yeah, since the Lando comes with it already and it's funny cause they come with it for, I guess it, it's mostly used for build or like, cause a lot of people are using node, but you can also, I guess, tweak the config and use it for hosting that JavaScript also. Uh, Any other questions, comments, concerns? All right. Thank you, John. All right. <laughs> So I think I was the last speaker, right? He was. Okay, so it turns out there's a bonus round. There's a bonus round, it's true. Hold on to your seats, folks. Okay, bonus round. I made a thing that you guys are gonna like, I think. Um, and it ties into all, everything I think we've been talking about. Um, NPM, all the scripting stuff, right? Testing, so this is about testing. Um, in a lot, in most of these big projects where you're dealing with this stuff, they're like, you need automated testing and you got to run these scripts and make sure it's working and there's acceptance testing. And you got to have all these things going and we've already got uh, Nightwatch. You got to make sure those are running and unit tests and everything's got to be running, right? So it can be challenging to figure out what, what is happening, what they're talking about, what the actual requirements are, what tests are supposed to run at all. <laughs> like how do these things work? And so in bigger comps, in bigger systems projects, you might like have be hunting around with documentation and talking to other developers to figure this stuff out. Um, and just from experience, I've, I've known that's always a challenge. And so with my recent project that I just started, I realized like I've had this kind of vision for a very simple way to do this. And I realized like, you know, I'm a big platform person. I built the, you know, my own little hosting system, blah, blah, blah. This is breaks it down to nothing. It's called just called YAML tests. So it's a simple executable that reads a test.yaml file and just runs them as a group. So it's like, you can put in the YAML file like what this is for. And so all you gotta do is like compose or require the YAML tests. And then the help text is pretty straightforward and tells you what's going on. But your yet test folder, can, your test.yaml file can be something as simple as this, where it's just, it run, this is nothing, it's just a name, and then this runs a command. And so you end up with this. Let me be more, let me give you a more complicated one. Yeah, so like two of the things they're gonna ask you to do is like syntax checking, lint, linting, and, <laughs> and uh, this code sniffer they've heard about. They wanna make sure coder analysis and code sniffing is done, static code analysis, right? That we were talking about earlier is exactly that. But sometimes the script is like really long and kind of complicated and oh, we need to add this option for the code sniffer and make sure it only runs against this particular there's all these specifics per project. So by kind of standardizing it like this, you get a tool that just says composer YAML tests and it reads the file, loops through them, gives you a pretty output with showing you all that information uh, and tries to give you the developer that's running it a really easy way to run it, tries to give the project management team an easy way to say this is the stuff that actually must pass and it also provides a standard way to run it in your CI because the command can be run in your Jenkins, in your Travis, in anywhere. And the coolest part is that it will, you pass it a token. Actually, I need to, this isn't even in the readme yet. This is how new this is. Okay. We're going to demonstrate this now because YAML tests, tests, YAML tests, of course. Uh, 
<laughs> so YAML tests has a test.yaml file, right? Um, and anytime you hear the word tests, it's like confusing and it's ambiguous and it, it is. Don't believe people are like, we need automated tests and don't say, oh, okay. Just say, you have to ask questions like, what type, what kinds, how are they run? How are the developers running them? Like, make it clear there's a lot more to that automated tests word requirement, right? So this isn't even the most readable. Okay, so this is open source readme on my new project. This is not a secret repo. It's really amazing what they're doing actually. It's the VA, it's va.gov. It's an open source repo that you can see. It's the code base running the content management system that is actually powering va.gov. Yeah, there's some, some familiar faces committing to this repo. And yeah, it's public. And the, we'll, we'll talk about this later, but the, the front end thing that builds it is also open source. So like you could go in there and build that and run that and run both the Drupal site and the, anyway, we'll talk, that's, that's really fun. But this is actually good people in the government trying to make things open and more, more better. <laughs> for the real people that need it the most, like our veterans and all of that. So I'm very thankful to be on this project. But the coolest part is they're like testing. We need to make sure this thing works. It's a government project, right? It's the military. Yeah, you gotta have a test. Like, how does it work? And so they let me do this crazy PR where it's like, they had a, you know, and you've been, if you've been in a big project, you've been in a JIRA where there's like 1300 tickets saying we need testing and needs to do this and automated this. And like someone's in a sprint planning meeting and I was, I'm able to now filter all that information and put it in a simple file that just lists what everybody wants exactly in this little YAML file, if I can scroll long enough, right here. And so what's fun about this is these are like, this is like the framework for really everything because deployment is the same as a test, okay? If you, can't deploy, if you can't run the update process, your test, your site's broken. You might not catch it in an automated test. So the update DB is a test, the config import is a test, all these things are tests. And so what I'm able to do now, on any project, I like doing this, I don't even have the site running locally. I don't remember what branch it is, okay. I'm not even gonna deal with you right now, I get. <laughs> composer, it shows up a command, composer, uh, you, wait a minute. Yeah, way to go. Sorry, buddy, the work, I can clone this brand new. Watch this, let's, let's do it from scratch. That's a better way because it's open source on the web. You can do exactly what I'm about to do. Right now it's still in the PR. We should probably merge it in a couple of days, but you can take this branch of this repo copy it. Oh man, the composer stuff is gonna take forever. What are you gonna do? Way ahead of schedule. We have to be out here by nine, right? 11. Totally. Uh, yeah, so this, oh, this is just a Drupal file, Drupal project, Drupal 8, composer JSON. You composer install. All right, everything's cached at least closely. I need to check out my branch, that's why it's fast, hold on. But this is an example of what we're talking about. Um, they use it too. You know, you can pull in extra JavaScript libraries with it. So most of the stuff is PHP. If you're not familiar yet, this, that's what a composer install looks like. Um, and there's other post things we can do to enforce, do all sorts of fun stuff. So uh, I have to check. There's, the YAML test thing is not in here. Um, but actually, this is global too. So you can install YAML test globally and call get compo composer YAML test from anywhere. I know this feels like work. We do this all day. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry to put you through it. Interesting. I gotta fin finish my bin script. There it goes. All right, so most of the time when you're in a big project, the testing output is like terrifying if you're a developer. We're really trying to simplify this because testing is really important. The only reason people don't do it is because it is a pain in the ass. Excuse my language, but it's like, you will tear your hair all day long. But now it's like, makes it super easy to say, this is a lot of tests, you're not gonna get this far, but 
this is an intentional failure, and it's doing the same thing as if you just ran that command. So anything you put in this test YAML file, I'll step through the step by step. You just call composer y because it has that composer co command shortening thing, right? See the no GitHub token found thing. We're going to do that in a second. It looks at the repo you just cloned. It knows what it is. This is the this is similar to Flow. Blaine, I'm glad you're here. Uh, reads the commit, and so the test has to be associated with the commit. And so GitHub has this feature we'll talk about in a second. But you have to have, let your developers run it locally if you're going to do test driven development, right? Um, this categorizes everything. You can see the failure, and we're going to add more things where it's like there's an easy way to output it to a file, each individual run. Um, and so that's called like asset saving or something. So this is really going to be very, very cool stuff as we add out the features. But you want developers to see this stuff. See, like the cache rebuild didn't work. You know, you got to have that as, a, as an automated test. Did the cache rebuild work? Uh, did update DB fail? Yes. And so what's, what's interesting, you know, there's a lot of, just from, you know, my years of doing this, I was like, this, we got to do something to make it easier for people. You get this awesome results. And so what's really fun now is like, is the uh, ER process, right? So I'll go back to the YAML test one. Now that you've seen a complicated YAML test, we can kind of make a, make a simple change to demonstrate how fun it can be. And so this, let me point out another thing actually, like, your tests live somewhere. If you have any project, their tests live somewhere. So they might be in a Travis YAML file. They might be in your Jenkins job. Like the code that actually runs to make sure that your project is working like has to live somewhere. And so the more you can do to pull that out and make it generic and you can just run it right next to your application and not need Jenkins to run the test, not need your containers, not need CircleCI, the better off you're going to be. So like even in the, our Travis YAML, Travis, is, 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 you heard it mentioned, this is a way to run tests on like public projects. It's not, you can combine it with Pantheon like he was saying to like test against your, your Pantheon site. But fundamentally like this, this file could get really hairy. So you're better off just having like this single command that so that this machine can run it and that your, your people, human machines can run it too. Okay, so for example, this is verbose now. So Let's just make another little simple test. That's fun. Um, you can literally name it whatever you want. I'll show you this, how this appears on the other end. Um, any ideas? Who wants to run a fun command? I know a fun command. Destroy rm rf. No, wait, 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 pseudo RMRF. Okay, any others? Uh, NYC hack, uh, ls-la, you know, etc. What, what's the nice files, OS release? Yeah. Um, another, I'm gonna try to make this YAML file more, even more, but it, uh, you saw the description thing, you can do like, um, I don't know, whatever. Silly, okay, so um, you can do like, Good test, God test. <laughs> um, ID, okay. Oh no, wait, sorry, command ID. Um, this is, oh, this is actually, this is toying with tests is will teach you about Linux. If you have an easy way to type out like, who am I and what is this? And like, you'll start to understand like what user is actually running that thing and where is it? And like, so, having a quick way to put a script in without messing with a bunch of shell scripts and having a fun way to do it like this is kind of really useful. Um, and as long as your developers have like a quick command to run. Um, I should do this locally instead of waiting for Travis. That's so boring. Yeah, you can run this thing against anything actually. Let's, let's show how agnostic it is by just doing composer, global, require, provision ops, YAML tests, and it installs it globally in composer. And anywhere you run it, it looks for a test.yaml file. So you could run it with like, any kind of project. And so once that's done, you can call composer and there it is, composer YAML tests and you do Y and it's like, nope, there's no nothing here. So tests, let's just go in there and like edit our test YAML file. 
that we just made. Did I copy it already? Yeah. This is who I am. <laughs> Composer, why? No? Oh, it's, it, sorry. It's not completely decoupled from the Git stuff. So this is a, you. a thing I want to add. We have to add. Um, there has to be a Git commit uh, uh, for this feature. Adding the test. Composer Y. Oh man, give me a break. Actually, let's just let it do it. It's not hard. No, wait, 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 wait. Sorry. I don't want to do that again. Thank you, Vim. Composer, why? <laughs> okay. Well, well. Moving on. Okay, so that's learning it locally, and it's a dry run. And here's an interesting, fun thing you can do. So let's make a, this is like develop, say this is your website, you're gonna make a new branch for a new feature, or more simply, we can just do a new test. I won't get, get all crazy, I'll just do like, okay. Um, commit, sham. Adding the test. Composer. So what did ID do? ID passed also, I got this nice info. But check this out. So in your CI, your, your CI guys will know all about environment variables. And they'll know about tokens. If you pass this thing a GitHub token, your PRs start to light up. And a token is, I won't even go into it, but this lets me in your CI thing talk to it. Okay, and what I need, I need to submit this as a PR too. So go back to my code, push. I'm pushing this branch I just made. And GitHub finally tells you, like, here's a link to create a PR. So I can just click right here to say, I think this is ready for a review, and I want you to run the tests on it. Okay, so I have to do this other step of saying, what is this for? And then GitHub gives me this nice thing, and I was like, what is this for? And I was like, I just want to know who <laughs> is running this thing. And I hit this, and from here, Travis takes over and does the same thing I just did because I already added my GitHub token to Travis. So I'm not even gonna actually, we'll see how long Travis takes because I could bake this locally. No, we'll, we'll, we gotta do it now. Enough, these people are impatient. You get that token. And boom, you can hack it in. So on the left, you can see it's from me, it's my token, not Travis's token. Huh? Make yes, fail. thank you, that is a part of this demo. Right, because this is actually super important. Um, I want a big ugly failure. Whatever, a tiny one and you'll get the idea. This is the best part, okay? Red, and not only is it red, but the GitHub API lets me post a comment, which I do with the results of that failure. So the developers immediately can <laughs> see, and now see how it's coming back now three or four and times? Scroll down. Because it's now, this is from Travis. Scroll down to the bottom. There's another thing it does. Yeah, yeah. You can't hit the merge button. Yep. 
Well, I don't have that set oh, up. You don't have that set up. <laughs> but you can set it up so that you yeah, let you, branch merge, protection merge becomes is a feature in GitHub. Great out. Which will prevent everybody from merging to master until these things pass. It's great. So what what happened now is actually Travis is now kicked in. And actually, and uh, let's go follow it. So that's the reason I got those four commits is because it's actually going to run four times in PHP 1, 2, 7, 1, 7, 2, 7, 3, thanks to Travis. But all of them, you are, I got to figure out and say only post back with this one. Uh, mm -hmm. Look at the one that already finished because it's going too fast. But there it is. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? YAML tests, questions? None. My favorite. All right. Awesome. Thank you, John. How much time do we got? We went over by uh, 43 minutes. No, okay. We'll do it next. That time. thing's powered by another tool we built next called time? Provision or Power Process. The next and time. That's how it got that colorful dollar sign. This is what I run a run. This is what the output is, and we're adding all these tools to make Power Process and build everything on top of that. So that's another cool, cool task uh, because running things on the command line is crazy unless you actually have a history and can save it and can read it properly. So that's, All right. That's my talk. So thank you, John. Um, woo, John Pugh. Woo! Um, so we want to just, we want to try a new thing real quick. We'll, we'll do it. We'll just do like one or two tonight and then we'll see how this goes and we'll expand it. For the next meetup, but we want to add a section to the to the meetup, which is just ask your Drupal questions. There are a lot of people here that know a lot of things about Drupal, and you, there's a lot of people here that have questions, comments, something that they've been that's been bothering. How do I do X? Is there a module that will do Y? What should I do about Z? Etc. So, who? Any interesting? Anything, any interesting horror stories that you've come across recently? Exactly. Um, so let's open the floor. This is Drupalers Anonymous. This is a safe space, everybody. This is a safe space. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions about what project you're working on or what you've been thinking about doing or anything like that, let's, anyone, anyone, anyone? Thank you. So, this is something that I, um, so I'm working on a, on a decoupled Drupal 8 project. And I guess if you have a drip, decoupled project, it's, uh, uh, so you, if you use, I mean, by decoupled, I mean, you use Drupal only f as a backend and you have a, like a front-end framework as a front-end, I guess, so which means none of your, your visitors will actually visit Drupal. It's only for the editors and the administrators. They will all, all only, go to the front end, the web front end, and not to, not to Drupal, right? And uh, so my question is, uh, in that case, obviously you don't even want them to, to be able to access Drupal. You don't want them to be able to log into Drupal. And uh, so something I just, like, I couldn't find an easy solution. Actually, I found a module that was kind of doing something similar and I had to patch it to actually lock people or visitors out of Drupal unless they are administrators. So is it something that I just miss, I, am I missing something or is it really not trivial and there's, I mean, I'm actually I'm wondering what other people working on decoupled projects, what do they do? So how, how do they keep visitors out of the, the Drupal side? Because uh, the reason I'm, I'm asking is because once you have a user on Drupal, you could actually log in. You just don't want them to, to log in directly into Drupal, right? But, but it's, it's not that their username and, and password does not work. It should work. You just shouldn't be able to, for them to log in directly. So is there a solution for that? One, one, thing that, one thing that we've done at NBC is we have locked it down based on the network, right? So, I mean, this is, this is a hack to be sure, but based on the network that they're joining, if they're not in the right, you know, subnet or whatever, then no. Yeah, I was going to say the same bad answer is that, <laughs> and it's not like it's my decision, but in bigger projects I'm on, like you can't even reach the CMS URL right. unless you have like a special VPN or like a proxy 
uh, or something like that. So they don't even have to worry about letting people log in. Yeah. If, uh, if you care that much about letting people log in, then it's not a terrible solution. Right? Yeah. In a weird way. That's serious. Yeah. The other thing is like, there's got to be a module for that. <laughs> I, know that, I know there's a module I saw recently, I can't remember the name, it's driving me crazy, that, that you can't, like if the intention is, hey, I created this node for some other reason, but I don't actually want the view page of the node to show up anywhere, I can lock that down. And if I create, you know, and you do that for any kind, kind of entity, and any, you know, so I know that there's, that's kind of sort of related, but it's not what you're looking for. Um, Rabbit hole, that's the one. There you go, thank you. Um, but eh. I think it also really depends on how your users are using it, because uh, some front end projects do use the Drupal site as like the API for the list of users that can log into the front end tool, which is pretty powerful because Drupal has REST already. So if your user base is completely separate, you know, you could just lock it down and make it private and like, you know, like yeah. only password people can log in. I know there's modules to do that. Um, you, you could also, but if you want the, if you, if you, that the tricky part for me, the hardest scenario for me thinking about it would be like you do are you are using Drupal users as your customers. You want them to use the front end, but you don't want them to access the back end, but you want their front end to talk to the API of the same right. site. That's tricky. And you might just want to just think about like removing the route to log user login or something like that. I don't know. And only serve it over REST API, something like that. I mean, another very non-kosher way is that if slash users is where the login point is, do a really nasty reverse proxy and just have like hide it away with its own secret URL. And just so, like whenever like somebody do slash users, it just takes them to nowhere. Yeah. They slash banana and don't tell anyone. We have another question over here. Is this another question or or, or an answer to this question? Uh, so what's the efficient way to actually uh, exchange data between development environments? So an efficient way to exchange data between development environments. Yes. So like entity type values and so on. Um, so I mean, Drush is typically, I mean, some Drush somewhere along the way is what people will typically use to sync between two different environments, right? Um, you can do, you know, the, 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 the most common scenario is get me the data from prod and bring it down to my local dev or get the data from prod and bring it to stage or some, something like that. Um, and then often you'll build that into some Jenkins command or some, some other. So command. there is a Jenkins command for that. Well, Jenkins is, is like cron on crack, right? Jen that's all Jenkins really is. You have to like tell Jenkins at this time or based on this triggered event, run something, right? Jenkins doesn't do this out of the box. But Drush, which is the shell, are you familiar with Drush? Yeah, so Drush does have a command, Drush sync, right? Or DB sync, or whatever it's called these days. Um, SQL sync, thank you. SQL. Um, and you can set up Jenkins to run Drush SQL sync environment A, environment B, and then it will get all of your data, it'll get the entire database soup to nuts from here to here. Mm -hmm. You can even say, oh, and by the way, skip these tables, right? We don't want uh -huh. the cache tables and they can, they, depending on your site, they can be kind of big, but we don't want them because the cache tables are useless when you move it along. Um, all, like the semaphores table, which ends up locking things if you don't skip that one. There's a couple other tables that like, you would typically skip. Um, but generally speaking, you get the whole thing. Where it gets really tricky is when you're working on a site and the production database is like, 60 gigs of data or some nonsense like that. That, I've, I mean, there are a lot, and I'm, this is open to everybody, but there's a lot of different strategies that people have used to try and, you know, limit the amount of data that, that you're actually syncing. It, it's really complex and really complicated at that point. I know you probably have this problem with Drupal.org, whose database is like absurd. Um, so maybe you wanna quickly chime in. You know how that works, I'm sure you do. <laughs> um, we have a bunch of scripts that do, I think, some Python scripts. Uh, the, extra, um, the extra difficulty we have on Drupal.org is we want community members to come in and have a dev site and work on Drupal.org, uh, but we don't want to show them pa everyone's password hashes and other unpublished content. So uh, we have a whitelist of all the tables and columns that are okay to be in a development environment 
And if we add something else, uh, it doesn't get into development environment until we put it into that whitelist. Thank you. That's, a, that's another really key thing to just keep in mind is like there's a sanitize, um, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Option. That's a very difficult word that I was looking for there. There's a sanitize option in the Drush SQL sync that lets you like clear out all the passwords and make them all just like password or one to do revive or something and clear out all the e email addresses from the users and make them all go to nowhere or, or whatnot um, just so you don't accidentally get into a position where you're taking production passwords and production email addresses, even though they're nice and hashed and salted and all that good stuff, you just want to just you know, let's make them go away. And don't accidentally email everybody, right? You can change everyone's email address to no at email.com or whatever it is, um, or just localhost or something like that. Um, all right, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna call it on that one. That's a good question, but Everyone like the idea, right? It's good. Yeah, it's a good idea. Um, so we're going to keep this idea going. Thank you. It was definitely my idea. And by my idea, I mean I stole it from other people. JT. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so the next meetup is Wednesday, July 10th, right here in this very room that we are standing in now. Um, make sure that you RSVP on meetup.com. Um, tell your friends. Everyone here has to bring two friends with them to the meetup. That's a requirement. Um, or we don't let you in. They have to RSVP. Um, they got to RSVP. And, and, but they have to RSVP as well, right? Uh, but no, joking aside, like, bring, bring your friends, bring your coworkers, bring other people who are interested in this stuff. Um, we, we put a lot of work into the, to the meetups, and, and I think we have been on a roll lately with some really excellent content. Um, so, you know, tell your, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your neighbors' friends. Okay. Um, Alex, Alex, before you call it, yes. Who in this room wants to present something. Could be five minutes, could be 30 minutes, could be 60 minutes, doesn't matter. But who is interested in presenting something? We have nobody slated for next month yet. So we're looking for people. So if you are interested, just raise your hand and I will come bug you in 30 seconds. Anybody, anybody, anybody? Nobody, okay. You know you want Maybe to. Maybe no presentations next month. You know you want to. All right, think about it. Everyone go home and think about a topic for next meetup. Okay. Um, and, oh, so we just, okay, there it is, call for, for organizers. Uh, after party, House of Booze, um, downstairs, 51st Street, 8th Avenue, um, and, uh, yeah, thank you everyone for coming. That's it. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here.